This is your last homework to turn in. You're on the second to last day of class. There will be one more assignment, but it will be easy. Uh, to do the course evaluations, you'll get uh, easy homework points. I'm not sure how much yet. Some easy homework points for doing the course evaluation. There is a due date. I need to look that up, what the due date is. That's I, December 11th. So is that on Sunday? Yeah. Okay. Um, so Sunday, get it done by Sunday. And I don't have any control over that, so make sure you do it by then. And did you get an email about this particular course already? Okay, good. So I'm not sure how many points, but you'll get easy homework points for doing that. I can't see your evaluations, those are kept private, but I can find out who's done them and who hasn't done them. So you can get points for that. It's not extra credit, so the only thing is if you forget to do it, it can hurt you. So make sure you do that. Today we're uh, in lecture A. I think we're just going to go over that homework problem that you made the printout for. And we'll talk about how to think about it without the computer. And then we'll look and see what the computer gives. Um, that's going to be an interactive species model, and we'll think about using no plans to help us. And then in lecture B, I'm going to introduce uh, one more new model, the model of pendulum, which is kind of similar to a mass and a spring in that it's oscillatory motion, but it's, it's this kind of motion. It's swinging back and forth, which when the amplitude gets large, it's actually not very close to a sinusoidal type of function. And in fact, if you give it enough, big enough kick, you allow it to go around the horn here, it could be this kind of motion. So it's kind of like a mass in the spring, but there are differences. And that'll be our last new model we will review for the exam on Friday. All right, so let's, let's make a new section to consider this problem fresh here. Just call it another interacting species model. But we will do it by hand first. It's again, problem 17 in section 11.9, page 653, if you want to look at it. I'm actually going to write the differential equations a little differently at first than what the book does. It's a system, you're considering these equations together, dx of t and dy of t. So x and y are populations of certain species. And 17 is a competing species model. The interaction terms have negative coefficients. And if you multiply things out, actually if you multiply the x partially through the parentheses, the equations look like this. x times 1 minus x minus one-third x times y for the dx dt equation and y times one minus y minus one-half x times y for the dy dt equation. So pretend that this is a final exam question, okay? I want you to make the phase plane for this. Perhaps I give you some sort of help to help you make it more accurate, but let's go ahead and pretend that I don't. How would you go about trying to think about the phase plane? It's good to think about, with these models at least, not all models are this way, but with these interacting species models, it's good to think about what is happening to each individual species in the absence of the other. For example, what's happening to x when y is 0? What's happening along the x-axis? When y is 0, this term goes away, y is 0. And what you're left with is dx dt equals x times 1 minus x. That's a logistic model with k, the coefficient there, equal to 1, and carrying capacity, which is what you would divide out x by, equal to 1. x is the same as x over 1. So Along the x-axis, the positive x-axis, first of all, you have an equilibrium at 0. And you're also going to have an equilibrium at 1, 0. x is 1. That's going to correspond to where this is 0. x equals 0 and y of x equals 1. If you were to draw 
the slope field for this equation by itself, you'd have equilibria, equilibrium solutions at zero and at one, which are constant functions that are solutions. You'd have solutions with positive slopes between one and zero, and they'd look like this. We've seen that before. That's logistic growth. And you have solutions with negative slopes when you are above the carrying capacity. Solutions are going to decrease towards the carrying capacity. In the slope field, for this equation, ignore this term here. For this equation by itself, it would look like that. That means in the phase plane for the two-dimensional system, you're going to have equilibrium points at 0, 0, and 1, 0 along the x-axis where y is zero, we're ignoring y for the moment. And solutions increase toward one <clears throat> for initial conditions between zero and one, and decrease toward one for initial conditions bigger than one. Just like in this picture, solutions go up when the initial condition is between zero and one, and they go down when the initial condition is bigger than one. That's going up, going to the right. That's going down, going to the left on this line. A similar kind of thing happens with the y equation. When x is 0, this term goes away, and that's a logistic model, the same logistic model as with the x equation. On the y axis, when x is 0, you're going to have the same kind of thing happen. An equilibrium point when y is 1, increasing solutions when they start out less than 1, and decreasing solutions when they start out greater. So for these interacting species model, when, models, when you see logistic parts like this, you can certainly, you're certainly going to have this kind of thing happen. But the hard part is what happens in the first quadrant. What happens over here when your initial conditions are both positive? Is there another equilibrium point or not? There may or may not be another equilibrium point. To figure it out, to see if there's another equilibrium point, you want to try to factor as much as possible. And we can factor out the x. And if we do so, we're left with the way the book wrote the equations initially. x times, in parentheses, 1 minus x minus 1 third y. And factor out a y in the second equation, you get y times 1 minus y minus 1 half x. That's the way the book wrote the equations initially. I could conceivably write the equations this way initially, and you should be able to factor over them. See how that works? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm just a little lost. So the book, uh, oh wait, never, um, you see how the factoring goes? Is that the issue? Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, because I'm just wondering why if you were, Okay, so you're factoring out a lot? I'm factoring out an x here. Okay. There's, two, there's an x here, there's an x there. All right, so... I'm left with the 1 minus x and the minus 1 third y there. So is the equation on the right the factored version? Yep. Okay. Exactly. Okay, okay. One on the right. The only possible other equilibrium points that are going to occur for this kind of model, possibly in the first quadrant, are when both of these things this and this are zero. Which results in a system of linear equations. And you can rewrite that system like this. x plus one third y equals one. And one half x plus y equals one. You see what I did there? I'm imagining setting these things that I underlined equal to zero, and then doing a little rearranging. Adding x to both sides and one third y to both sides of the first equation, and adding one half x and y to the both sides of the second equation. I'm ignoring this part here, because I've already taken care of that part essentially. The origin's always already an equilibrium point. This is zero when x is zero, this is zero when y is zero. <laughs> Also, when x is 0, this part will be 0 when y is 0, or excuse me, 1, giving you that equilibrium point. 
And when y is 0, this one can be 0 when x is 1, getting that equilibrium point. The only possible other equilibrium point, possibly in the first quadrant, is going to be the solution for where what their underlying equilibrium is 0, which is equivalent to this. There are a couple different ways you can solve such a system of algebra equations. There's something called elimination. You have a little linear algebra doing elimination of with matrices. Uh, row operations, they're called. That's an okay way to solve it. You also, this is simple enough, you can solve it for one of these variables in terms of the other, say this one for x in terms of y. And then you can substitute that into the other equation in place of x to get an equation that only involves y, solve for y, and then go back to this and solve for x. That's called substitution. After that substitution, Multiply that by 1 half, I'm going to get 1 half minus 1 sixth y plus y equals 1. Simplify that. y minus 1 sixth y is 5 sixth y. Subtract a half from both sides. 1 minus a half is a half. Now multiply both sides by 6 fifths. 6 fifths times 1 half is going to be what? 3 fifths. Looks like y is 3 fifths. Plug that back into this equation to solve for x. x is going to be 1 minus 1 third times 3 fifths, which is 1 minus 1 fifth, which is 4 fifths. So when x is 4 fifths and y is 3 fifths, Say 4 fifths is right around here. I'm just going to make a very faint little mark there. And 3 fifths is right around there. These are not equilibrium points. That I don't want you to get confused here. There and there. Where the, that vertical line and this horizontal line meet, right about there, there's an equilibrium point for the entire system. Maybe a little more to the right. Okay? What about null clans? Let's go ahead and find the null clans, and we're going to see, maybe it would have been better to find the null clans first, actually, before the equilibrium points. You know, the equilibria on the axes are easy enough to find. The x null clan is where dx dt is 0. Where this is 0 which is the same as before this is 0, which is going to occur at when x is 0, which is the y-axis, and where that's 0. x equals 0, or 1 minus x minus 1 third y equals 0. That's the y-axis right there, the vertical axis. What about this one? Solve for y as a function of x. You'll get 1 third y is negative x plus 1. And that means y is negative 3x plus 3. The y null cline, or the x null cline, is a line with this, well, besides the y axis, on which the vector field you can see is already vertical, is a line with the slope of negative 3 and a vertical intercept of 3. And actually, it's going to go through both of these points. It's going to look about like this. I'll draw that as straight as I can. That's 3 up there. That's part of the x and the line. Also, the y axis is part of the x and the line. The vector field is vertical on that have dx and d is 0. Make a bunch of little vertical lines. It's already vertical on the y-axis. Solutions are going straight up here and straight down there. What about the y no plane? Do I have a red marker here? I've got a blue one. Oh, there's a red one over there. Okay. Well, that's not so good. So let me throw that away from me. Good catch. 
Oh, uh, this is only a little bit better. The Lino plane. Where dy and t is zero, where the vector field is horizontal. There's no vertical component to the velocity vector of solution curves. <coughs> That's going to occur where y is zero, looking at this expression right here, which is the x-axis, which we really already knew about. The vector field we already knew was horizontal there, left and right. Or where this is zero, One minus y minus one half x is zero. Solve for y. Y is negative one half x plus one. Zoom in on that if it's hard to see. A line with a slope of negative one half and a vertical intercept of one. Come back here to the Base plane that's going to look about like this, and it will go through both of these equilibria. The vector field's horizontal there. Where blue and green intersect, you get equilibria. For example, right there. And actually, the x axis can be thought of as blue, so you get an equilibrium there. And the vertical axis could be thought of as green, if I'm making, again, my x known plane green and my y known plane blue. So where blue and green intersect, here, 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 and here, you have equal to green points. If blue intersects blue, like it does right there, there's no equal to green point. If green intersects green, like it does right there, there's no equal to green point. Another question is, what is the sign of the right-hand side functions in the one, two, three, four different regions in the first quadrant that these null planes break the first quadrant up into? Call this entire thing f of x, y, a function of two variables. So here's a little bit of multivariable calculus. Where is f of x, y positive? It's positive when x is positive, which is automatically going to happen in the first quadrant. So we only need to think about the sign of this thing. Where is that positive? You can plug in different points and test them. Actually, the easiest thing to do is to plug in the origin. x is 0, y is 0. You get a positive quantity there. And you're going to get a positive quantity for other points that are close to 0 that are what is the x null plane? It's in green. That are to the left of that green line in the first quadrant. dx dt is going to be positive in these two regions. You can make right root pointing errors. dx dt is going to be negative when you're to the right of the green line in the first quadrant. x is positive, but this thing becomes negative when you are to the right of this green line. You're going to get leftward motion of solution curves. How about dy dt? Think about where g is positive and negative. We're in the first quadrant. That's automatically positive. So we're going to need to focus on that thing. Once again, when x and y are 0, this is positive. And in fact, when they're close to 0, small positive numbers, this is positive. <laughs> when we're below the blue line, that's upward motion of solution curves. dy dt is positive in both of those spots. And when you're above that blue line, when x and y are relatively big, dy dt is negative, so solution curves go down. When you combine these arrows, you get solution curves moving to the southeast in this one. Velocity vectors of solution curves point to the southeast. Northeast in this one, Southwest in this one, and northwest in this one. Right? Southeast, southwest is the same as down to the left, northwest is up and to the left, etc. 
that helps you. Now you pick some representative initial conditions. For example, if your initial condition was up here, you got to move southwest, and you're going to have to cross that null climb there vertically. And once you cross it, now you're heading to the southeast, and you're forced to head toward that equilibrium point. If you start down here, you're going to go to the northeast, northeast. you're going to cross the blue line, that null line, horizontally, and head toward that equilibrium. You're forced, once again, to head toward that equilibrium. Down here, you're going to go to the northwest, you're forced to go up there. Down here, first you're going to go to the northeast before you cross the green line vertically and head to the northwest. Over here, you'll head to the southwest, cross the blue line horizontally, and now head to the northwest. What's the real life conclusion here of this competing species model? It seems like no matter what the initial conditions are, as long as they're both positive, we are heading toward some sort of stable equilibrium point, also called an attractor in this case. In a non-spiraling way, heading toward this point where X's population is four-fifths and Y's population is three-fifths. Units could be thousands, so four-fifths, thousands would be 800, three-fifths, thousands, 0.6 thousand would be 600. Does that really happen in real life? Probably not. Okay? Again, these things are overly simplistic. And you should not really take them very seriously as far as quantitative predictions go. General qualitative predictions, though, sometimes do need to be taken seriously. Like, will one species die off or the other? Will they reach equilibria? Even though you may not know where that equilibria for the real life situation really is because this oversimplifies things. It's kind of a metaphor of what could happen. Might be the best way to think of it. Of course, there's more than two species, too, right? Hundreds, thousands, if you include microbes in any environment of species, is, are going to be there in that environment, plus plants as well. Okay. Let's use Mathematica to confirm this now. I'll type in the equations as I initially had them. It was x times 1 minus x minus, uh, I think it was 1 third x y. 1 third x y, yep. Or x times y over 3. g of x y, the right hand side of the dy dt equation was y times 1 minus y minus one-half xy, x times y over 2. You can find equilibria. You can solve the system of algebra equations where both of these things are equal to 0, like this. Four equilibrium points, the exact same four we found. Then you can make your plot. What do we want to show? We want the vector field in the background, so the first thing is vector plot. What goes inside the curvy braces in the vector plot? The right-hand sides of the dx dt and dy dt equations. f of xy and g of xy. Let's say x goes from negative 0.1 to 3. y goes from negative 0.1 to 3 as well, say. Might be a good window. This will give us a basic picture. Arrows not of the same length. They should be proportional to each other as far as their relative proportions with their true lengths in there. Let's rescale these since it'll look nicer. Vector scale, arrow 0 0.03, 1, none. Let's add in um, the equilibrium points. We can do that with list plot. Zero, zero, one, zero. So 
this is the kind of thing you should have done for this homework problem. Four fifths, three fifths. Can make them bigger in black, say. I hope as I'm doing this, you feel like you could do this maybe even from memory by now. Maybe not these extra things here. There's some extra stuff, and there you do see we're getting a similar kind of picture. The solutions, the solutions have to follow the vector field. Let's put the nullic lines in here. You can do that with contour plot. Where does f of x, y equal 0 and g of x, y equal 0? They can go inside a list like that. And then we can color them with contour style. Of course, you probably copied and pasted what I had to some degree at least, which is okay, but there we go. Where red and blue intersect, that's where we get equilibria. Red and blue intersect there, 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 and there. Not there, that's blue intersecting blue. Then, uh, you know those squiggles, that's the inaccuracies. Red intersects red there. Um, I can make those inaccuracies go away by plotting more points. I think contour points? No, let's see, plot points. Plot points, arrow, <laughs> something bigger than 15, for example, I think it'll look better. Try 50. Yeah, that looks better. Still not perfect. What about solution curves themselves? And what about re-emphasizing the meaning of position vectors, velocity vectors, and acceleration vectors? Let's do that and pay attention to think about meaning of things. Again, I can use that ND solve value. I can look up the syntax. I think I remember it from memory. I can go x sol y sol is going to be what's, what I'm going to store the output of any sol in, an x solution and a y solution. Any sol value. You're not going to be tested on this kind of code, but I think it's worth learning a little bit about anyway, and certainly if you take it in the spring, you'll want to know this. These are differential equations we're putting in here. dx to t, or x prime of t, is f of x of t, comma y of t, don't forget to put the t's in like that. y prime of t is g of x of t, comma y of t. Let's pick an initial condition. Why don't we pick one? Why don't we pick one over here? So we can see, remember those vectors in the true vector field were pretty long over here. We can see the curve move pretty fast when the vectors were long and then it's going to move slower when the vectors were shorter. So my initial condition could be x of 0 equals 3 and y of 0 equals maybe 0.1. Solve for x and y. I think, if I remember correctly, you don't put the t's in there. Though you do put a range of values for t, like 0 to um, 10 would be, should be good enough. Probably you could get away with sort of 2 or something. So I answer that. I'm not getting any errors, I'm getting output like that, like that. What that means is Mathematica has stored some interpolating functions internally in its memory, whose graphs look like this. And you can access that information that's stored in there by putting that in a plot, parametric plot, in fact. Well, let's put it after the contra plot, parametric plot. By the way, even if you're not going to be in DFQ, even if you're going to be in multi, parametric plot is useful in multi. I think I can do x solve t. 
y sol a t of t, t goes from 0 to 10, well, let's make it magenta. So here we'll see the whole solution curve, just like that. But now let's animate it, let's put vectors in. You didn't have to do that for your homework. And I hope the way that I use Mathematica is coming across clearly too. I always work it. Start simple and make it more complicated. If you can get it to do the simple thing, then that'll help you get it to do the more complicated thing. That's the way I use it, and I think that's a pretty good way to use it. B is going to be my time parameter, as usual. I need to put a B here. Make the animation in the parametric plot. That'll animate the curve itself without any vectors yet. And we do see it moves pretty fast at first, then it slows down. The arrows in the true vector field, that's not just the direction field, the true vector, they were long over here, and they got shorter over in this region. So you can see it moving fast at first, then slower. It looks horizontal here. Technically, it's not. Technically, in this region, you've got to be moving to the southwest. So you're moving to the southwest, but it's mostly west. Okay? It's not horizontal. It's, it's going down ever so slightly. You just can't tell. Here, it's definitely moving northwest. And let's add in the vectors to emphasize the meaning of those things again. Not that adding these vectors is necessarily important for the differential equation. But it re-emphasizes the meaning of those things. Um, maybe I should go ahead and define a C of t to be x sol of t on the y sol of t. I could then do a C of t here. OK, say a thick. Uh, magenta arrow for the position vector, starting at the origin, going to C of B. Let's see if that works. Yep, there's an arrow. And it moves as B increases. It's like a pen tracing out the curve. That's the position vector. Actually, if there were any vector that's most important to put in here to give meaning, it would be the velocity vector for the curve. And again, we are talking about vectors for the curve, not for, not, not for rabbits and foxes running around or something. We're talking about the motion of the curve itself. Let's make the velocity vector be blue. Start at C of B. And at C of B plus C prime of B. It's long at first, so long it goes up to the left of the picture. That blue line there, that's part of the velocity vector. It's pointing to the left. It's going off the picture, but as I let it play, it'll get shorter. There we go. And until it's so short, you can barely see, you only see the head of it. It's always tangent to the curve. It's always pointing in the direction of motion at any instant in time. Finally, what about the acceleration vector? Make it brown. Change the C prime to a C double prime. It's going to point in the opposite direction, generally speaking, than the blue vector does. Well, I guess here, it looks like it's on top of the blue vector. It may be pointing in the same direction. Maybe we're accelerating it first, but it should generally point in the opposite direction because the speed should be slowing down generally. Oh, I guess maybe that was just inaccurate what I was seeing. It is generally speaking pointing in the opposite direction. Here's a nice time to look at right about there. The angle between the velocity vector and the acceleration vector is close to 180 degrees. The acceleration vector is the rate of change of the velocity vector. So the fact that they're opposing each other like that indicates that the blue vector's got to be even shorter. Time. 
we are, the speed of the curve is slowing down. The blue vector starts turning here as well, and I think the angle between them gets a little bit bigger maybe as the blue vector starts to turn. Very smaller, I mean, smaller angle. It's hard to tell here. Yeah, there, right above the air, the angle's getting big, smaller, closer to 90 degrees now. Indicative of the fact that the blue vector is turning some here. And then they're going to go back to pointing in almost the opposite direction here as the blue vector, as the magenta curve now is pretty much straight. Now they're pointing in the opposite direction, indicating you're still slowing down. We can find the speed if we like. I'm going to do that trick I mentioned last time using the dot, something called the dot product. If you don't know what a dot product is, don't worry about it. We can't, there's no formula for the speed except maybe involving an interpolating function here because the interpolating functions don't have formulas, but we should be able to graph the speed. as a function of time. There it is. The most interesting thing about it here is it looks like it does have maybe a, a critical point right there in inflection term as well. That's kind of interesting. That's maybe unexpected. You don't really see it on this graph so, so well though. Still hard to see there. And we can do the distance traveled as well. However, probably we need, need to use n integrate. Because again, there's no formula for the speed here. Just a numerical representation. Actually, I'm not positive that any n integrate will work, but let's try it anyway. I've never tried this with this interpolating function here. <coughs> Let's see if we can plot the distance traveled along the curve. Maybe, but it could take a little while because it's doing a bunch, bunch of integrations. Let's let it go. No, oh, there it worked. Should go through the origin. That's the distance traveled along the curve. Again, not distance traveled for the species, okay? It has nothing to do with the species running around. We're talking about the curve itself. So you can bring in all these things and think about them all if you want in the context of these differential equations and the phase points. I think it's kind of, kind of cool, even if it doesn't necessarily mean much. All right, let's take a break.